When our next presenter sent me their biography to start working on the introduction, I suddenly realized it was going to take an hour just to introduce them. They've done so many things in their life. They've taken their love for flying and they've developed a, a business to help others enjoy that passion. Over the last 35 years, they developed an 18,000 square foot facility creating computer-based and online training programs, helping pilots enjoy the love of flying. They're the first couple to hold every category and class pilot certificate and flight instructor certificate. They share PIC duties by alternating PIC on each leg of their flight in their Falcon 10. Both are on the Charles and Ann Lindbergh Foundation Board of Directors and John is the chairman of the board. The Professional Pilot Magazine named them the Aviation Educators of the Year. The National Transportation Association awarded John their excellence in pilot training. And Martha is one of the top 100 distinguished aviation heroes honored by the first flight centennial commission at Kitty Hawk. In 2005, Martha was awarded the Cliff Anderson Award for Achievement from the National Aeronautics Association and stands with other recipients such as Jimmy Doolittle, Roscoe Turner, General LeMay, Frank Borman, Scott Crossfield, Anne Morrow Lindbergh, and Ernest Gann. Recently, they completed a round-the-world flight in their Falcon jet observing aviation in various countries. Almost every pilot in this country is familiar with their training courses that prepare them for the knowledge and the practical tests. They also have a very common sense approach to flight safety and their everyday uh, operation in their airplanes. Today, their topic is practical risk management. Let's welcome the most enthusiastic flying couple I know, John and Martha King. Well, thank you very much. You did a good job of that, Walt. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello, fellow pilots. In case there's any confusion about this, I'm John King. And I'm Martha King. And we are standing up. <laughs> you know, pilots are not normal people. Just take a look around this room. Think of your friends who fly. You aren't normal. We're not normal. And that's because you're very special people. So, you know, Martha and I have spent a lifetime in aviation, and we've been hooked on it big time. We've always had a little bit more airplane than we can afford. And people will tell me, uh, John, you're lucky that Martha will fly with you. And I always say, lucky? What are you talking about lucky? It costs twice as much. She wants to fly half the time, and she's got an opinion about everything. You know, John likes to think that our relationship exemplifies that old saying that behind every successful man stands a great woman. You got it right, Martha. That's exactly the way I feel about it. <laughs> what he doesn't realize is the truth is in front of every great woman stands some guy without a clue who's blocking her view. <laughs> For 43 years, I've been putting up with this. It's just the way it's gone the whole time. You know, um, we have just absolutely loved our flying. As I said, we've always had a little bit more airplane than we can afford. For instance, we had a Cessna 340, and then we moved up to an old Citation. And the, the Citation was the old, very original uh, business jet, and it was really, really, compared to today's airplanes, slow. And it was so slow that controllers called it a slotation. Or they would, if they were in a bit of an annoyed mood, they'd call it a mutation. And sometimes they'd call it a crustation or a frustration. You know, that old, old Citation 500 was just about the slowest jet that was ever built. And I don't, did you know it had a special bird strike problem? It got run down from the rear. <laughs> so after about uh, uh, 10 years of flying, actually we flew that airplane for about 14 years and enduring all of these uh, slotation jokes, uh, we have got rid of that airplane and went out and got an old Falcon 10. And an old Falcon 10, in contrast, was for, for many years was the fastest general aviation jet ever built. Uh, in fact, it was 150 knots faster than that old Citation. 
And so, as you might guess, the insurance company had grave misgivings about this mom and pop combination flying this hot jet. So they said, look, we don't care how you get your type rating, but we want to make sure that you guys go out and get simulator training. So we did, we spent two weeks of simulator training, and I have to tell you, it was just about the hardest two weeks we ever spent in our lives. I mean, beads of sweat were coming off of us. But when we got done, we figured we must have done pretty well because the instructor got us aside. He says, John, Martha, I've got wonderful news for you. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. What's that? He says, well, you'll never have to worry about a mid-air collision in this airplane. And I said, that's marvelous. Why not? He says, you are so far behind this airplane, you won't even be involved. <laughs> he says, you're going to come walking up to the crash site some 15 minutes later. So we've, we've always tried to keep ourselves uh, and one of the reasons we've gotten so many licenses and ratings is we always like to be in the learning process because that's where most of our customers are. And, you know, if you haven't been evaluated for a while, if you haven't taken a check ride for a while or taken a knowledge test for a while, you kind of forget what it's like. And so we've always tried to put ourselves in a situation where we've been doing those kinds of, kinds of things so that we're in that same mode where you realize that no one really likes to be evaluated. No one likes to go through check rides. And, and unfortunately, we've done a lot of them, but that's the reason we've done them. Ever since we got our pilot's ratings back in uh, 1969, we've been using an airplane for serious cross-country transportation for our business and, and also just for the fun of it. And over the years, we've developed some, t uh, some tools that we use that we'd like to share with you this morning for risk management. Tools that we use and, and we hope that you'll use also to help you have trips that ha are more fun and stress-free and make sure that your passengers will fly with you again because we've had a few of those who won't fly with us again and we'll tell you why so we want to talk about this morning the most important consideration in flying and also the most feared emergency in all of aviation now since the barnstorming days we in aviation have been telling what Martha and I call the big lie and the big lie is a lie that if you've told it often enough and long enough, eventually even you get to believe it. And we've been telling the big lie in aviation, and the big lie in aviation is the most dangerous part of the trip is the drive to the airport. And, you know, at Barnstormer days, they told, oh, it's everybody would come up to this airplane held together practically with bailing wire and say, is it safe? And they say, oh, it's perfectly safe. Well, it's intellectually dishonest to characterize aviation as an altogether safe activity. It's not a safe activity, it's a risky activity. In fact, um, although it may be true, for, and is true for the airlines, that it's safer than driving, it's not true for general aviation. Unfortunately, if you take our accident rate per mile, fatality, our fatality per mile. rate, fatality, thank you very much. Martha straightens me out from time to time. Uh, take your fata our fatality rate per mile, we have a seven time greater fatality rate per mile than automobiles do in general aviation. Now, we're 49 times worse than the airlines. The airlines do very, very well. But the general aviation fatality rate per mile is on a par with motorcycles. So the fact is there are risks involved in aviation. And one of the problems with the risks in aviation is that they're, they're sneaky and insidious. You know, when someone comes to grief in, in, in an airplane, generally at that last minute, just before they realize they're going to crash, they're the most surprised people in the world because they did not see it coming. And so one of the things that risk managers tell us is when that the risks are hard to evaluate, uh, we don't do a good job of it. Well, you know, uh, the problem with flying is you go out and take off low ceilings, no visibility, and you really don't know how much risk you're taking. You really don't know whether today you're going to get away with it or not get away with it. It's very hard to judge. And so when the risks are hard to judge, it's hard to judge the probability of something going wrong and the consequences. When it's that way, we don't do a very good job of evaluating risks. So, and and it's, that's just the nature of risk management, that people just don't do a good job of evaluating risks when they're hard to judge. So we in aviation, because of that, just because of human nature, haven't done a good job of that. But I can tell you this, if we leave the risks in aviation unmanaged, they are unacceptable. And I can illustrate that with a question I'd like to ask you. And if this question is true for you, I'd like for you to hold your hand up and leave it up and look around the room. 
And the question I want to ask you is how many people in here know someone personally who's been killed in a general aviation airplane? If you know someone who personally has been killed in a general aviation airplane, hold your hand up, look around, you'll find that more than half of us in here know someone personally has been killed in a general aviation airplane. And my point is, if you look at the amount of time that we spend flying versus the amount of time that we spend driving, you realize that we really have a horrible accident rate in general aviation. Now, do you want to go out and tell your mother-in-law that? No, let's not do that. Let's not make, issue a press release and tell the press that. But if we did, don't admit it to ourselves, we're probably not going to do a good job of managing the risk. So we think that the first step in managing risks is to admit that there are risks. And then you start going systematically ways to identify those risks and strategy to manage them. One of our problems in the general aviation industry is that when we all went through flight training, the way that we were taught risk management and the way we practice it generally today was flawed and still is flawed. The problem is in general aviation, 85% of our accidents are caused by a failure in risk management. But of course, what does our flight training focus on? It focuses on physical maneuvering, physical skill with the aircraft. When students leave flight training, the accident rate jumps by almost 50%. In other words, during student training, the accident rate per 100,000 hours is about 5.8 accidents per 100,000 hours. For new private pilots, it jumps up to about 8.55. Now, what that tells us is that during flight training, flight instructors are doing a pretty good job of risk management and of supervising their students and making sure that the flight instructor at, through their supervision uh, is exercising good risk management and controlling it. So the, the accident rate is pretty low considering that you're starting with someone who has no idea how to manipulate the controls of an airplane and moving on to getting them ready for their private license. But apparently, in general, instructors are not able to pass on to their students the instructor's own risk management techniques and philosophies so that the new private student can use that as they go on with their unsupervised flying. How risk management has been taught in the past and generally is still taught today is by telling stories, passing along rules, making up sayings. Making up sayings like, the only time you can have too much fuel is when you're what? On when fire. you're on fire. Right. The two most useless things for when you're in an airplane are the runway what? Behind you and the altitude where? Above you. Um, it's a lot better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than where? In the, the air, air wishing you were on the ground. <laughs> These are all great sayings. They all have a lot of truth, a lot of validity to them, but they're not enough. The problem is that pilots, is how pilots become experienced pilots once they get their private license. You know, the way that we became, quote, experienced pilots after we got our private pilot license is we went out and did stuff. And you'll try different things, and then you evaluate the result. Well, how did that work out? And if you try something and you don't scare yourself, you put it in the acceptable category. But you may have just been lucky. But you didn't scare yourself, you said it was acceptable, and the more times you get away with it, the more acceptable it becomes. But if on the other hand, you do scare yourself when you try something, you go, oh man, I'm not gonna do that again. And you add it to the list of things that you have decided that you're never gonna do again in an airplane. Now, the, and what happens is, if you do this long enough, and you don't run out of luck, Eventually, you have a real long list of things that you've said you're not going to do again, and you become what they call an experienced pilot because you've got a long list of these things that you've tried and you've managed to survive. Well, the problem is experience is a hard teacher because she gives a test first and the lesson comes after it. 
And many times the pilot and their passengers never survive the test to get the lesson. So in our uh, uh, opinion, this is a bad way to go about it. Because first of all, it doesn't prepare you for something you haven't tried yet or haven't thought about yet. And so you're not prepared for other things in the future. And so you're not prepared for unanticipated things, things you haven't tried or thought of. So what we think we ought to do about risk management is be systematically proactive instead of reactive. When people talk about aeronautical decision making, it always implies to me you get yourself in a bad situation and then you make a decision to get out of it. And we think that, that even talking about aeronautical decision making is not as helpful as systematic risk management. So Martha and I, by the way, um, uh, had an accident in an airplane uh, that we want to tell you about. And it's kind of, in a sense, how we, quote, became experienced pilots. Because after that accident, we had a real wake-up call. And you might say, uh, well, in fact, we changed everything from that point on. You might say we became born-again pilots. So I want to tell you about that accident, what we got from it, and why that made us want to work very, very hard on risk management so we could survive the rest of our flying years. Now, back when we had this accident, we had a Cessna 210. It had a turbocharger on it. And we were, at that time, teaching two-day ground schools for a living. And what we would do, we lived in San Diego, and we taught our ground schools in places like Fargo and Spokane and Sioux Falls, South Dakota and Billings, Montana. And what we would do is we would leave from San Diego, California on Friday and fly out all day Friday to where we were going to teach the ground school. We'd take our books and charts and so on with us. And then on Friday evening, we would get in, set up the hotel room, make sure everything was working OK. Uh, and then on Saturday and Sunday, we'd teach the two-day ground school course. And on Monday, we would help the FAA give the written exam. And on Monday afternoon, we'd fly back to San Diego. And we got back to San Diego, we'd do all the things you do when you run a small business. We'd set up the other classes and answer our phone calls and do mail and all of those things. And then, uh, so we'd spend Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at home. Friday, we'd go out to another city and start it all over again. So we were going back and forth, uh, flying all day Friday and all day Monday, back and forth to these two-day ground schools. And we were getting plenty of flying in at that time. We were getting a lot of flying in at that time. So on the accident trip, on this particular trip, we were leaving from San Diego, California, going to go to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And uh, we stopped at La Junta, Colorado for fuel. And to our credit, when we landed at La Junta, we got a very complete weather briefing. And what we found out is the weather at Sioux Falls, when we would arrive right about dark, uh, the weather was going to be three miles visibility, forecast to be, and a thousand foot ceiling. Well, marginal VFR, but no problem. We were flying IFR. In fact, what we did is we got up on top of the clouds and canceled IFR, and we had a turbocharged airplane, so we were flying at 11,500 feet, a little higher to get a little more speed, and canceled IFR and flying along on top of the clouds. And after a little bit into the trip, we looked over there and said, son of a gun, look at that. The generator isn't charging. We thought, oh, man. As it is now, we got a late start. Uh, we're going to land uh, at, at right about sunset or dark in, in Sioux Falls. And if we land and get that generator fixed, it's going to take who knows how long to get it fixed. And we're going to arrive really late. We have to set up the classroom and so on. Here's what let's do. Let's just turn off everything electrical. And, and, and we're pretty good at holding a heading. We'll dead reckon until we think we're within the vicinity of Sioux Falls. It'll be about three hours. And then we'll turn on the generator, call up approach control, and get an approach into Sioux Falls and land at Sioux Falls, and we'll get the generator fixed uh, when we're at Sioux Falls. So we do this. We fly for about three hours. We think it's time. We turn on the electrical system. And what do we get? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. nothing. The battery was stone cold dead. Oh, holy mackerel. It's time for plan B. So, all right, we really do now have a pilot-induced emergency. So we will use our pilot's emergency authority to let ourselves down through the overcast, and we'll find this uncontrolled airport on the outskirts of Sioux Falls. We'll just land there, 
and, and get the uh, uh, generator fixed and we'll continue business as normal. Now, the only problem was that if you're familiar with the Sioux Falls area, they have lots of t very tall TV antennas there. So we said, well, this may not be a good idea in the Sioux Falls area. Let's turn left and head north and dead wreck until we think we're about 40 miles north of Sioux Falls. So we turned north, got about what we thought was 40 miles north of Sioux Falls, and decided, okay, now's the time. We're going to let ourselves down into that overcast. The tops of the overcast was about 10,000 feet. We let ourselves down into that overcast, and all of a sudden, whap, ice all over the wings of the aircraft. Now, when you do not have an electrical system and you have icing conditions, what else do you not have? The airspeed indicator. So the airspeed indicator P02 by ice is over and the airspeed indicator goes 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, and it keeps slowing down. You think the airplane is slowing down big time until it goes below zero and you know it's not backing up on you. So we continue down. And now we had been flying by dead reckoning for about three hours now, so we didn't know exactly where we were. So therefore, we didn't know the height of the terrain where we were and we didn't have a current reported altimeter setting, but we continued down until we thought we were 100 feet above the ground and never saw the ground. Oh my goodness. We pushed the power in, started back up through the clouds and picked up our second load of ice. And now we are on top and I am absolutely terrified. I am scared to death. Martha and I have a funny rule. And our rule is one of us flies one leg and the other flies the next leg. And if I try and touch the controls when she's flying, she breaks my arm. I would have given anything for it to have been Martha's turn to fly the airplane. I am absolutely panicked. And I said, Martha, we are in real trouble here. I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We'll find another airplane and we'll follow it to an airport. And she said, John, that's not gonna work. We had gotten this weather briefing and we had actually talked about there was some place somewhere where there was about a 5,000 foot ceiling and five miles visibility. But to save our souls, we couldn't remember where it was. And in my panic state, two or three times, I'd pick up the microphone to call for the weather and realize, no, the radio is not going to work. Put the microphone back down. And so Martha keeps saying to me, John, we have to go back down. And I said to her, Martha, I don't want to go back down. Because we go back down there, we're going to hit something. We're going to hit a TV antenna, we're going to hit a barn, we'll hit a silo, we'll hit a tree. Who knows what we're going to hit? But this isn't going to come out well. We were down within 100 feet of the ground and never saw anything. Now, while we're having this conversation, the sun slowly sets below the horizon. And Martha says to me, well, John, would you rather do it now or in the dark? I hate it when she thinks that way. <laughs> so we start down into the clouds to pick up our third load of ice. And as we go down, the windshield is all iced over. There's ice on the wings. We just are a flying block of ice. And once again, we got down to where we thought we were within 100 feet above the ground and still did not see the ground. And I'm saying to Martha, we've got to go back up. She says, John, we've gone back up. There's no place to go. We've got to go down. So we continue on down. And finally, I spot a road with some cars on it. And they got their lights on. And I said, Martha, we're going to, we're, it was a little country road, one of these, you know, with a hump in the middle. I said, we're going to go, go land on that road. She says, no, 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 there's power lines there. Now, at this point, I have to tell you, Martha's really getting on my nerves. <laughs> So I just sidestepped over, and trees are going by. Things are going incredibly fast. We've got ice on the windshield, ice on the wings. And I said, that's it. I don't care where we are. We're landing right now. Just reached over and pulled off the throttle, and that airplane settled down and just flared just for an instant, and it's on the ground. And 
Uh, what was going on there is they had about 18 inches of snow on the ground and about an inch and a half crust of ice because they had a freezing rain uh, ice storm going on. And so it literally was a block of ice and I had no idea what our speed was when we touched down, but we had very little margin left because just we flared and it touched. It just simply had no flare to it at all anymore. So we went along on top of that crust of ice for about 75 feet. And then the airplane, we had the landing gear down because we wanted to keep our speed under control going down. Had the landing gear down and, and then it fell through that crust of ice. And at that moment, I began my all time record short field landing. <laughs> because the airplane just stopped immediately and went up over its nose. Now, if you're familiar with a Cessna 210, the landing gear retracts rearward. And in order to make room for the landing gear, there's a shelf on the back, and the luggage is kind of elevated a little bit on the shelf. Now, again, remember, we were not yet born again pilots, so we weren't too bright. And so we had all of that luggage behind us, which was our books uh, that we were going to teach the class with, computers, plotters, our own personal suitcase, a toolbox with wrenches, rags, oil can openers, and all of that was on that shelf. So this next conversation takes place with our heads pressed up against the panel of the aircraft uh, and with luggage jammed in all behind us. And Martha says to me, uh, John, I'm, I'm okay. She says, I hit my nose on the panel of the aircraft, but I'm okay. I've got a bloody nose, but I'm okay. And I look up and I see this hole in the windshield of the aircraft. And I said, to heck you hit your nose on the panel of the aircraft, your, your head went through the windshield. She says, no, 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 I just hit my nose on the panel of the aircraft, I've, I've got a bloody nose, but I'm okay. And I reached over and I felt her back and there was blood all down her back. And uh, I said, well, you know, you've got something a lot more serious than just a bloody nose. But at this point, you could hear things trickling in the airplane and things sizzling on the engine. So I said to her, but why don't we carry on the rest of this conversation outside the aircraft? <laughs> and she said, uh, and I said to her, look, I've got this luggage pressing me up against the panel of the aircraft. I said, I can't reach my door handle. Can you reach your door handle and we'll, we'll go out your side? And she says, well, I got luggage pressing me up against the panel. I can't reach my door handle either. So it took me about 15 minutes to rearrange all this luggage to the point where I could open the door handle. And so I opened the door and I went around to the aircraft and out in front of the aircraft was this long string of trash, rags, oil cans, oil can openers, wrenches, all out in front of the aircraft. And I thought, I'll be darned, somebody crashed here before we did. <laughs> and I got over to the right side of the aircraft, opened the door, and, and in that instant, for the first time in my life, I realized how incredibly dumb allegedly bright people can be. Because what had happened is that toolbox had gone from back and gone, uh, beat Martha about the head and the shoulder, head and shoulders, and gone out that windshield like a shot. And it hit Martha in the back of the head, and there was blood splattered over every inch of that airplane in the headboard all over the side panels everything was just sprayed with Martha's blood and I looked at that and I thought you idiot you absolute idiot how dare you take such a risk with the most precious thing in the world and of course, the insurance company called a truck to come in. They took the airplane apart. They put it on that truck and they took it to the hangar. And the very first thing they did when they got into that hangar is check to see what was wrong with the generator. And a single wire had, come, had become detached from the generator. All they would have had to have done is replace that one single wire, reattach it, and we would have been on our way safely. Because we did not want to reattach that single wire and take the time to do that, we put everything on hold. We put every single thing that we cared deeply about at risk. And we did become born-again pilots, and that's how we became experienced pilots.
Now, like John says, this was our own airplane and we were getting a lot of flying time in it. What caused that accident had nothing to do with our physical skill. In fact, he pulled off a pretty good short field landing. <laughs> the problem was our total lack of good risk management on that flight. So as a result of that accident and some other incidents, some of which we're going to talk about here this morning, but um, some of which were not because this is the FAA building, <laughs> we've developed, as I said earlier, some tools that we use and we hope you'll use to manage the risks in flying. And one of them is that we as pilots need to be proactive looking for risk, conduct risk surveillance. You have an airplane, you, it needs an annual, you take it into the shop, maybe you flew it in from another airport. As far as you're concerned, it's usually working fine, maybe a minor squawk, but nothing significant. But as soon as the mechanic gets that airplane in the shop, what do they do? <clears throat> they pull out a checklist and they start surveilling the aircraft for things that are potential problems, things that could break or could be a problem if they're not attended to, if they're not mitigated now. So what we as pilots need to do is to conduct the same kind of surveillance for risk just like a mechanic looks for defects during an annual. Before takeoff, we've developed in conjunction with the FAA a risk management checklist called the PAVE checklist that lets you pave your way to a safe flight. This is when you're doing your original flight planning or, or your pre-flight shortly before takeoff to help you evaluate and manage whatever risks might uh, exist. And the P stands for pilot, the A for aircraft, the V for environment, the environment, a little bit tortured, but we always have to have our acronyms, and the E for external pressures. And what you do is you take a look at the risks in a particular flight and you put them into these different categories and you think about them and say, how am I going to mitigate this? How am I going to handle this? And make sure that I'm aware of the issues involved. Now, the risk for the pilot are start with things like, well, are you current in this airplane? You qualified for this airplane? Um, are you, if you're going to fly on instruments, are you really ready and proficient for an instrument trip and so on? And the other thing is, is what's the physical condition of the pilot? Uh, we use the I'm safe checklist that goes, have you had an illness or uh, are you taking medication that could be a problem? Are you under extraordinary stress right now, which is a risk factor that you want to manage? Um, are you under the influence of alcohol? Or, uh, are, and, and it's not just eight hours from bottle of throttle. Sometimes if you've really uh, had too much, you can feel bad for a couple days afterwards. Well, you wouldn't want to fly during that period. And then fatigue and food, you want to think about. A lot of times people will work all day and then get in the airplane for an evening cross-country flight and they don't have dinner. And so here you are, fatigued and hungry. Is this going to help you do a good job of risk management? And finally, the E in I'm safe is for emotion. If you're mad at the world, it's not a good time for you to be making decisions about your flying, and it's not a good time to work it out by trying to fly an airplane. So you do the I'm safe checklist. The next uh, item is the aircraft. And is the aircraft capable of what you're doing, asking it to do? Uh, can it handle the load you're asking it to handle? Does it have the range that you want? Can it fly uh, uh, in, at the altitudes you need because you might be flying in the mountains? And when, when you're thinking about altitudes, of course, one of the things you want to think about is density altitude. You know, I think everyone, if you've flown long enough, eventually has a time, a place, and a date where for the first time in their lives, they truly understand the concept of density altitude. And for me, that was about three in the afternoon on July 26, 1970 in Lone Pine, California. And during that time in our flying lives, Martha and I had a Cherokee 140, and they called it a two plus two because they did not want you to think of it as a full four, a full four place airplane. So it had two seats in front, of course, and then it, in the back, it had a bench that you could either put luggage on, or if you didn't have passengers, you could snap in some seats. And so they called it a two plus two because once again, they didn't want you to think of it as a four place airplane. But we always thought of it as a four place airplane. 
So we had another couple with us, and we're going to, from San Diego, California, for the first time in our lives, the Death Valley, California. And we're really excited about seeing the famous Death Valley. And we're headed on our way, and we're flying along the Owens Valley. And all of a sudden, this brilliant idea occurs to me. Wait a minute. Death Valley is famous for being remote. If they don't sell fuel there, we won't have enough fuel to go anywhere else. And I don't know whether they sell fuel there or not. So maybe we better land somewhere and get fuel on the way to Death Valley. So on a very impromptu basis, we chose Lone Pine, California, at about 4,000 feet elevation in the Owens Valley. And we went down there and landed in this little Cherokee 140, and it was hotter than, than hell. It was hot. It was very, very hot. And it must have been about 110 degrees. Here we are at a 4,000 feet elevation. And this old man saunters very slowly out of the FBO building and walks up towards this, and as he got close to us, I said to him, fill it up. And he gave me a long, slow look, and he said, you mean just fill it to those tabs there, don't you, sir? And I said to him, did I stutter? I said, fill it up. And he goes, okay. So he proceeds to fill up the airplane. We go in, go to the bathroom, get some, get some sodas. We come out to the airplane and get ready for the takeoff. Now you should know you're doing something wrong when you get ready for a takeoff and it draws a crowd. I mean, we had people lined up in front of that building because there was going to be one hell of a show. And we didn't have a clue. So we packed all four people in that airplane, closed the doors, taxied out to the end of the runway. And I happened to be the one flying the airplane. And we got to the end of the runway. We put the throttle forward, and those wheels just slowly started turning. And we went to the whole length of that runway. And when we got to the other end, I rotated. Because it seemed to be the thing to do. <laughs> That airplane staggered into the air. It had a little red stall warning light with a stall warning light on. And so help me, we flew around trees for five miles until we could get the speed to get that airplane to climb out. When we finally got the airplane on its way and we're on heading, I looked back to see how our passengers were doing. <laughs> All I could see was four big silver dollars staring up at us. That couple never did fly with us again. But on that afternoon, on July 26, 1970, at 3 in the afternoon in Lone Pine, California, I truly understood the concept of density altitude for the first time in my life. The V in PAVE stands for environment or the environment. What environment are you operating in? Uh, what's the airspace like? What's the terrain like? What do you need to do about routes? And of course, the environment includes the weather. One of the big problems that we had on this 210 flight was we had gotten a good weather briefing in La Junta before we took off for Sioux Falls, but we didn't write it down. So when we got the, had a problem and wanted an area of, you know, halfway decent weather that we could dead reckon to and let down through the clouds to a decent ceiling, decent visibility, we couldn't remember where it was. And that's one of the really neat things about getting your weather briefings on the computer with the FAA DUAT system because you can print it out, you can take it with you. It may be more weather than you normally use, but if you ever have a problem, it's fabulous to have all of it there uh, with you. And that's what John and I do now. This idea, by the way, of having an ace in a hole, someplace if you're IFR where you know you can go to and you could get down through the clouds just by getting down, say, a 5,000 foot, five mile ceiling, is an important thing to do on every flight. We had actually talked about it, but couldn't remember where it was. Well, if you've got your weather with you, you're going to know what your ace in the hole is at all times. Another thing to think about if you think about the environment is day versus night time. And you know, we do about 10% of our flying at night time 
but have almost 50% of our accidents at nighttime. So the risk factors are very, very much greater at nighttime than they are during the daytime. And one of the things you need to do is make sure you pre-flight your airplane for a nighttime trip. So if you're going to fly at nighttime, are the lights working and so on? We have a horrible story that we won't take the time to tell now where we got ourselves out over the ocean at nighttime because we didn't check to see if the lights were working and we couldn't see where we were going. Uh, we could have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. We'd just taken a few seconds and made sure all the lights were working before we flew it at night. And that we had a flashlight or two with us. That would have been helpful also. <laughs> We had a lot of discussions about it afterwards. You know, we do these things, and we have these long discussions about it. So if we'd figure it out ahead of time, we could have eliminated a lot of words flying back and forth. The E in PAVE stands for external pressures. What external pressures are? Is there things that are not directly related to the flight itself, but they have to do with why you're making the flight? You're going to a business meeting. You're going to a wedding. You're going to a family reunion. You've got a holiday trip to a vacation spot, whatever it may be. But the point of the external pressures is that they are constantly on your mind and they are even if it's in the back of your mind putting pressure on you to keep flying to make the trip to keep on going and make you ignore all of the other uh, risk factors that may exist so what do you do about risk factors well first of all don't let the uh, external pressures make you ignore the risks in those other uh, categories of the pilot, the aircraft, and the environment. And the second thing is make sure that you figure it out ahead of time how to handle it. For instance, um, if we're going somewhere and someone wants to meet us, we try to not have them meet us. We'll say, well, we'll rent a car and we'll come see you. Uh, that gives us more flexibility so somebody's not standing out on a ramp waiting for us, worried about us if we've had to land because of weather or because we needed to get more fuel. If they insist on meeting us, we'll lie to them about what time we're going to get there. We'll tell them that we're going to be there an hour later than we actually expect to arrive. And again, that gives us flexibility so that we can land and get fuel if we need to, land to check the weather if we need to, and we're not, we don't have the external pressure of thinking they're standing on the ramp waiting for us. We take phone numbers with us, cell phone numbers of people. Uh, one of the things we also do uh, because we go back and forth across the border a fair amount is we have a satellite phone in the airplane so we can call people from the airplane if we have to to tell them that we're going to be delayed uh, we're, it's going to take us longer to get there. Now if we're doing this business of lying to the people if we get there an hour earlier we just clean the windshield, we refuel the aircraft, we load in our flight plan for the next trip and we're relaxed and by the time they show up we're all ready for the next trip and we're very relaxed about the whole thing. Another thing that Martha and I do is if we're going to go even get a hundred dollar hamburger we always take an overnight bag with us and the reason is if the weather gets a little marginal or we have any kind of mechanical problem we says hey we got our bag with this let's go in a hotel we'll spend the night and we'll worry about it in the morning and that way we don't feel pressure to get back. Now one of the ways that you can find out whether or not these external pressures are pushing you and making you uh, worry about uh, or ignore all the other risk factors is do you feel that you're late? Anytime you feel that you're late and need to hurry up, you're at risk for ignoring all the other risks. You're going to press on in spite of, uh, what's, uh, of the fact that you've got all of these risks. So you'll press on in bad weather. You see someone had an accident. They pressed on in bad weather. They pressed on with a mechanical problem. Why did they do that? Well, they did that, one, because they had not managed the external pressures, so they felt that they were, it was very important for them to continue. And then there's a second thing we need to talk about on external pressures, and it's hardwired into us. It, pilots are an extraordinary group of people. You learn to fly because you persist to accomplish a goal. Pilots are, by nature, self-selected to be hardwired achievers. We are achievers. We are hardwired finishers. We finish what we start. And so in flying, that very persistence that is so wonderful goal in life, very good attribute in life, becomes a risk factor in flying. You just hate to give up on a goal. 
and that is a risk factor that we all need to manage. Those are all part of the external pressures. So you need to manage those. Manage your own goal uh, orientation. We're, we have goal-oriented behavior. Manage the fact that you don't want to get yourself in a bind where you feel like you're under elate or under pressure or really need to complete this trip uh, at this time. So the PAVE checklist is something you can use during your pre-flight planning and your pre-flight to anticipate the risks of the flight. But what about once you're in the air? While you're airborne, you can use the CARE Attention Scan to manage risk. And CARE stands for Consequences, Alternatives, Reality, and again, External Pressures. Now, we're all used to the concept of the six-pack instrument scan where generally you're going to be focused on the attitude indicator and you spoke out to the airspeed and back to the attitude indicator, out to the altimeter, back to the attitude indicator, spoken out to different uh, flight instruments depending on what phase of flight you're in and what's going on. That same concept applies with the care attention scan. What you do is focus on aircraft control as the center, and that's what you always keep coming back to, but you spoke out to think about the consequences of what's happening now, to think about what alternatives you have, to think about the reality of what's going on, and to think about external pressures and what are they doing to you as far as ignoring other risks. Now the C in CARE stands for consequences. Now before you started your flight, you, 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 you identified the risks in the PAVE checklist, the pilot, the aircraft, the environment, external pressures. The instant you get airborne, every one of those things changes. As you go along, the pilot becomes more and more fatigued, the aircraft uh, gets less and less fuel in it. Um, the, uh, uh, in, you're flying an airplane over changing terrain, the environment is changing because you're getting later and later in the day, it might even be getting dark. And the closer you get to your destination, the harder it is to turn around, the harder it is to stop. And so even the external pressures intensify as you go along. The closer you get to your destination, the more and more you might realize you're getting behind, you're late, and the more pressure you feel. So all of these things change. So the C stands for think through the things that are changing when you're flying, because flying is a process of change, and think about the consequences of those things. Now let me give you an example, and, and, uh, and when you think about the consequences, you want to think through more than just the superficial level. You want to go down a few levels in it. Let's assume you've planned a trip, you get airborne, and you look at your GPS ground speed, and you think, son of a gun, I'm about 20 knots slower than I thought I was going to be. Okay, now let's think about the consequences of that. First of all, you're going to arrive late at your destination, more fatigued, lower on fuel, uh, and late uh, means it, it might be darker than you thought. And so all of those are the first level of consequences just because your ground speed is slower than you thought it was going to be. Now, let me ask you another question. If your ground speed is slower than, than what you thought it was going to be, why is that the case? What caused your ground speed to be slower? Probably the wind is different than you thought it was going to be. Now the wind drives the weather. It determines the location of pressure patterns and fronts. So if the wind is different than you thought it was going to be, the weather is likely to be different than you thought it was going to be. So now, here you are with an airplane lower on fuel, a pilot more fatigued, uh, later in the day, uh, and all of these things, plus the risk that the weather is going to be different than you thought it was going to be. And as luck would have it, probably worse. Well, now when you first started flying on that trip, you had a circle of alternatives that was equal to the length of your trip plus whatever reserve you had, and you could go to any airport in that entire radius all the way around. As you fly along, you're using up your fuel, and the circle of alternatives just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you're at your destination, your circle of alternatives is only equal to the amount of reserve fuel in any direction. You've got a little tiny circle. So you always want to have, the second part of this, of this care checklist, is always want to have an alternative course of action in mind, and possibly several alternatives in mind. 
Well, if you have identified the things that are changing and that there are a problem, it becomes a no-brainer to land and re-expand that circle of alternatives. So now that you can arrive at your destination with a huge circle of alternatives. So the C stands for consequences and the A stands for alternatives. The most important rule in all of flying is always have an alternative course of action in mind in case the flight cannot be completed as planned and hopefully have several alternative courses of action in mind. Now as John said, one of the big thing that, things that controls what your alternatives are is how much fuel you've got left in the aircraft because fuel equates really just to time. Uh, how long are you going to be able to stay up in the air? Let me ask you a question. This is a sucker question. How many people in here believe that general aviation fuel gauges are absolutely reliable and accurate? <laughs> no takers? Okay, let me ask you a different question. Who in here remembers when, by FAA regulation, is the only time that our fuel gauges have to be accurate? When the tanks are empty. Isn't that handy? <laughs> So you need to make sure that you have an accurate way to know how much fuel and therefore how much flying time you've got left. And your alternatives are not just for fuel or weather because think about it. You could go into an airport, be headed for an airport. It's got a single runway. Somebody lands gear up. Somebody has a prop strike on the runway. Only one runway, that runway is closed, you're going to have to go somewhere else. Normally not a very big problem, certainly not here in Florida with all the airports you've got. But if you're in a somewhat more remote area like out in the Intermountain West or out in western Kansas, western Nebraska, or you've got a situation where there's a lot of fog and you don't have as many alternatives as you otherwise would have, the airport being closed because there's a disabled airplane on the runway could make a big difference. So always have alternatives. And the R in CARE stands for reality. Reality simply means deal with things as they really are, not the way you plan them to be. When John and I flew that 210 flight from La Hunta to Sioux Falls, we planned to fly it with a perfectly uh, good mechanically uh, working airplane. That wasn't the reality. But what happened when we had the generator failure, we just kept on going as if nothing had happened. We were ignoring reality. We need to make sure that we deal with things as they really are, not just the way we planned them to be. Now there is one thing um, that is the biggest cause of, of VFR fatalities in, in aviation. Anybody know what it is? Continued flying VFR in worsening weather conditions. Now, let me ask you a question. Do people deliberately take off and fly in weather that they know will kill them? No, the weather changes. But what do pilots have a tendency to do? Keep on flying as if nothing had happened. So what is our problem in general aviation? The problem is when things change, we go into denial. We get into denial. Why are we in denial? Because we're goal-oriented. People talk about get-home-itis. I don't think get-home-itis explains it. I think goal-oriented behavior explains it. We just hate to give up on a goal, no matter what it is. So we keep on going, particularly if we're late, if we have someone waiting for us. We'll risk our very lives and the lives of the people with us in the airplane to not be late for those people waiting for us. So the answer is, when things change, change your plan. Do not let the external pressures make you go on when you shouldn't. And the E in CARE again stands for external pressures, which are pushing you, as John says, to keep on going and to ignore those other risk factors. Don't let those external pressures make you ignore the risks in those other categories. Now, if you're getting ready to do something in an airplane and you're wondering, is what I'm about to do wise, let me give you a standard that you can apply against what you're going to do and you will know instantly 
whether or not it's something you should do. And the standard is don't take risks with just your family uh, or friends that you wouldn't take if you had 100 paying passengers on board behind you. So if you're about to do something, ask yourself, well, if I had 100 people back there, would I do that? And if the answer is, well, no, I'd never do this with 100 paying people on board, then why in the world would you consider it for yourself and the people you care the most about? So the answer is, if you wouldn't do this with 100 or 150 or 200 people on board, well, don't do it the most precious things in the world, yourself and the people you care the most about. Now, we said we were going to talk about the most important consideration in aviation and flying, and that's to always have what available to you? Alternatives. No matter what happens, never let yourself fly out of alternatives. And pave your way during your uh, flight planning to a safe flight. The P stands for what? The pilot. pilot. The A for what? The aircraft. Okay. The V for what? The environment. environment, and the E for what? External pressures. Think about the risks, put them in these categories, figure out how to take care of them, how to mitigate them. Once you're in route, you can use CARE to manage the risk as you fly along. The CARE attention scan, the C stands for what? Consequences. Consequences. The A for what? Alternatives. Alternatives. The R for what? reality deal with things as they really are and the e again for external pressures well martha folks that pretty much wraps up john we haven't finished we also said we'd talk about the most feared emergency in all of aviation martha you're getting on my nerves again <laughs> she's right i hate it when she's right let's talk about the most feared emergency in all aviation anybody in here know what the most feared emergency in all aviation is everybody says an airplane fire. Other people say a ramp check. But that's not it. If you're a rental pilot, the most feared emergency in all of aviation is a runaway Hobbs meter. <laughs> Folks, keep the pointy in forward, the dirty side down, and by all means, please. Stay out of the trees. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>